Melbourne, Australia. Named the world's most livable city seven times. Sporting capital of the world. Mr. Duncan. Oh! oh! The big mummify. Oh! The cultural capital of Australia. A beautiful place to walk or run. Melbourne, my home. When the coronavirus reached us in early 2020, my home city was transformed from the seven time winner of the world's most livable city award to the most locked down city in the world. What unfolded here shocked the world and caused many to wonder what happened to Australia. The police violence, arrests, solitary confinement of political opponents, human rights abuses on a scale never seen before in this once free country, and ultimately the use of rubber bullets on unarmed, non-violent protesters. All of this was unimaginable, but became reality in two short years. In the middle of it all were ordinary people, people like us. My name is Topher Field. I'm the director of Battleground Melbourne. Today, I'm joined by Carly Soderstrom, Crystal Mitchell and Matt Lawson. We are ordinary people who faced extraordinary times and we each made life-changing decisions to stand up for what was right, even when our government was wrong. This is Battleground Melbourne Live, and these are our stories. 2019 had been one of the hardest years of my life. My clothing label that I'd run for 10 years had folded, which left me devastated. My life had not unfolded as I expected or dreamed it would. I had picked up work as a photographer at a design agency to help me slowly put my life back together. And then came the coronavirus. Staff at Wuhan Hospital are working around the clock to identify a mystery virus. This is the suspected source of the virus, a wholesale seafood market in Wuhan. The number of people who have died from a new type of respiratory virus in China has now passed 40. Do not travel to all of mainland China. I was a bathroom sales consultant. I wasn't political at all. When COVID hit the news, I was initially scared after seeing people collapsing on the streets of Wuhan. I thought we needed to take a precautionary approach by masking our vulnerable and protecting our elderly. I was absolutely on board with the early response. When COVID hit, I'd just reached 15 years as a Victorian police officer. I'd worked my way up to sergeant and I had recently become an acting senior sergeant at Gender Equality. I had previously worked at Ethical Standards and I prided myself on my integrity as an officer. I loved my new role and before COVID-19, I wasn't particularly interested in politics. I was a party swinging single issue voter for both major parties, One Nation, and I'll admit it, even the Greens. If you'd told 15-year-old me that I would one day be defying police and living by the motto, good people break bad laws, I would have been horrified. I was raised in a Christian conservative home and in my childhood, the Holy Trinity was made up of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Johnny Howard. Fast forward to when COVID hit 23 years later and much about me had changed. I knew well that the government were not to be trusted. So as the media began to mindlessly repeat all that they were told by the government's handpicked experts, I began to cast my eye overseas to see what the real non-political epidemiologists were saying. Victoria will be in lockdown within the next 48 hours. We are declaring a state of emergency in Victoria. These are not designed to have zero new cases. In effect, nothing we do can deliver that outcome. This is about, as everything we're doing, is about flattening the curve. The moment the first lockdown was announced, my boss told me I was being let go on a last in, first out policy. And so on March 20th, I went into lockdown with no income, next to known savings as I'd been cleared out by the closure of my business and I had no way to provide for myself. It was the first time in my life I was genuinely terrified. By the time there was support announced, I was running my life on fumes. What was left of my savings was gone and I wasn't allowed to work because my profession and my life was deemed non-essential. 
Lockdowns didn't affect me financially or socially. I was an antisocial, essential worker who got to work during the day and hit the couch and the TV snacks at night. I had a clear vision of the next 10 years of my career at Victoria Police. I was going to become a senior sergeant in charge of a police station, be totally awesome at it, nurture the newest police constables and create a workplace that coppers wanted to be at. Then in time, I'd become an inspector, I'd take on a proactive policing role and work with local community groups and not-for-profits to build resilience in our young and troubled youth. It was a perfect plan, nothing could possibly go wrong. It was after seeing Dan Andrews using the exact same wording as other leaders worldwide and fe feeling like I was being talked down to that I started to question the official narrative. Was COVID, re COVID really as deadly as they said? Were masks and lockdowns really the best response? My final straw was when my workplace asked me to put tape around my desk so that I was social dist distancing properly. I don't know why, but that was too much for me. I quit my job on the same day. I wasn't gonna go along with it anymore. As I researched, I soon found actual data from Sweden, Italy and Israel, and it was clear that this virus was a very low risk to someone under 50 in reasonable health. So I did the only smart thing to do. I publicly volunteered to be infected with the coronavirus. Hi, I'm Topher, and I hereby volunteer to be infected with the coronavirus. <laughs> what? Are you insane? Do you have a death wish? No, I'm, I'm just trying to help. We are helping. We're helping by staying right here on this couch. Yes, the video was satirical, but it was no mere publicity stunt. Herd immunity from people like me being voluntarily infected was a fast, cheap and relatively safe way through the pandemic. The lockdowns were a dead end that would keep us in the pandemic. But when I made that point in March 2020, I was mocked mercilessly. When I spoke out about my situation, I kept being told I was being selfish for worrying about providing for myself and covering my bills. That I wanted people to die because I wanted to work. I was told by people that did have an income that money and the economy aren't important. That's really easy to say when you've got money in the bank. Born the product of rape and a failed abortion pill, I grew up as a ward of the state in a home for boys and girls. As a copper, my dream was to use my success as a policewoman to give hope to others like me. COVID was not going to stop me from achieving that. My police career was my life passion, not just a job. I was proud to be a cop, proud of where I had come from, proud of what I'd fought to be here, and I was proud to work for an organisation that serves people, or at least that's what I believed. But I couldn't ignore the impact of the government's use of police on lockdowns forever. When we had the opportunity to withdraw our superannuation to survive, I did it and I set up a small photography studio in my home so that I could work from home and try and make an income for myself doing product photography. I wanted to work. I didn't want welfare or sympathy or anything else. I'm fiercely independent and quite proud and I don't like asking for help. I wanted to work my way back from the loss of my business the year before. But from where I was sitting as a non-essential, I could see clearly the devastation that would eventuate and how little those who, was, who were essential seemed to care. After quitting my job, I started to research what was going on around the world day and night. Then I started to post about what I had learned. Before I knew it, I had the police knocking on my door, taking me in for questioning and bullying me. All because I dared to post things that didn't go along with the official government line. I was posting things that in the years since are now accepted as absolutely true. As the lockdowns dragged on, I became really concerned for how vulnerable people were being affected and I began to speak up at work. Sure, us essential workers were all okay, but it did seem undemocratic to me that a Premier had the power to decide who got to work and pay their bills and who didn't. It's not like he turned the bills off when he locked everyone's in their home. Rent, electricity, school fees, where were people supposed to get the money to cover life's expenses? When I voiced my concerns to my colleagues, they just parroted the Premier's office propaganda. Staying apart keeps us together. Help stop the spread. Do your part, stay home, save lives. These slogans meant nothing to the people whose lives were destroyed by lockdowns. I was appalled and in my gut I knew it was wrong. But nobody at work wanted to listen. They were fearful of the virus, happy that their work wasn't impacted, impacted and they berated me. Crystal, we don't write the law, we just enforce it. 
After watching what I could see was clear corruption and egregious incompetence, I was bewildered at how easy people had accepted this as the new normal. I saw how politicised it had become and I began to speak out publicly as I'd already had an audience on Instagram of 10,000 people. I started carefully as hysteria and hyperbole was already rife. I warned about the dangers of echo chambers, demonising people with different ideas. But as time passed, I became more and more concerned. I'm an avid history nerd and pretty soon I started comparing Daniel Andrews' political tactics to Stalin in the early days as he rose to power. After my video in March 2020, I was invited to speak at the first ever formal anti-lockdown protest in Australia, a protest that was deemed illegal. And so, at 38 years of age, I found myself directly defying the government and the police for the first time in my life. The police were waiting when we got there, but this was early days and they really had no idea what to do with us. So after speaking with us, they gave us one hour before they would return and anyone who was still there would be arrested. In Western democracies, the government is supposed to be the servant of the people, not a bully. Yet what we're seeing from Daniel Andrews now is bullying and intimidation, an unprecedented power grab, and all based on epidemiological models which have already been proven to be wrong. This virus will pass, but the massive debt and the unprecedented power grab that we have seen will affect Victorians and Australians for generations. The media backlash was savage, but I'd taken my first step down this path to civil disobedience to stand for what is right, and I wasn't going to stop now. It was now that I first began to think about the concept that good people break bad laws. I desperately needed to feel that I wasn't alone in my thinking. Mainstream media and the Premier made me feel like I was the problem, not their pandemic response and messaging. It didn't take long to come across people online that were speaking out. Rukshan, Avi, Monica Smith, Morgan C. Jonas, Matt Wong, and Topher. I listened to what they all had to say, and I watched the live feeds of protests, and I felt connected to their movement. I wanted to meet them. But how? They were radicals my own organisation was fighting against. I'd read the police intel briefs on them. Heck, I'd been asked to write them at COVID Command Centre. During one of our rare breaks between lockdowns, I found out a market stall for democracy was going to be held at a farmer's market over an hour and a half from where we were living. My partner, who's also a copper, thought I was becoming a bit of a conspiracy theorist. It was hard to talk to him about my concerns at first, but if I could just get him to talk to other people who felt like me, maybe it would help. The excuse to get him to drive an hour and a half to a farmer's market? What a copper's love. Donuts. <laughs> We drove to get the best jam donuts in the state, and to my surprise, here was Morgan and Monica at their democracy stall. What a coincidence, a quick stop at their stall couldn't hurt, right? I met Morgan, and I lied about my name and my job. I read what Vic Pohl had put in those intel briefs, and I wasn't sure he could be trusted. My partner and I chatted with him for a while, and as we left, I made an impulsive purchase of some of their anti-government stickers. I had no idea what I was going to do with them, but I felt it was the only way that I could support them doing ultimately what I wished I could do, use my voice. The police intimidation and efforts to shut me up only confirmed my fears that something was very wrong with our COVID response. So I attended my first protest on Mother's Day in 2020. The protest was on the steps of Parliament and it was mainly mums and dads as well as their small families. The vibe was peaceful with music and dancing. That was until police brutally arrested two of the organisers for no apparent reason. I was blown away by the massive police presence for the uh, peaceful protest and then later that day I was blown away by how the media portrayed peaceful protesters as neo-Nazis. From that moment on, my trust in media, police and government had been completely broken. After lockdown four was announced, I released a video addressed directly to Daniel Andrews. That humble video went viral and all of a sudden I was invited to speak on mainstream news shows. Once again, I was very careful with my words. I didn't speak about the virus or the vaccine. I spoke specifically about the impact on small business in the hope that my story and my words would lead to some better policies and outcomes. Spoiler alert, it didn't. Two months later, when Melbourne's housing towers went into lockdown, I started to do nightly lives about the plight of the people in the towers so that ordinary Melburnians knew what was going on. In an unprecedented measure, nine public housing towers have been locked down 
residents there now locked in their homes for at least five days. A tongue-in-cheek call for help from those struggling to be heard, locked inside with zero notice. Nobody allowed to leave, nobody allowed to enter. There will be no reason for any of those residents to leave their home. The alternative uh, is this gets right away from us and we've got not just 12 postcodes locked down, but every postcode locked down. That happened in a block of flats right next door to where I live. So I actually saw the police coming in, saw the cordon, saw, heard, heard noises from inside those flats, heard people crying. Um, I was appalled. I was appalled because it was sudden, suddenly, it seemed to me that we had almost like a military takeover, even then, that they could just do that. Yeah, that frightened me. I couldn't bear what I was seeing in my home city, so I began speaking out. I was doing nightly lives on my existing photography page, which had around 3,500 followers. I watched people that I knew and loved block and unfollow me, uh, but I was determined to keep speaking up. I'm naturally quite reserved, but I found it therapeutic to speak out. Slowly the page started to grow again until I had around about 30,000 followers, interacting and sharing their stories of pain, heartache and loss brought on by their lockdowns. Then out of nowhere, my page was deleted. I wasn't doing anything illegal. I was simply talking about the lockdowns and their impacts on people. Eight times my pages were removed on Instagram. I was banned on Facebook, removed from YouTube and taken off Twitter. So I kept making new accounts and I continued to persist. So I've lied to my partner, driven an hour and a half away from home to meet two strangers who I've also now lied to, and now I'm going home again with a, just a fistful of bumper stickers that I had no idea what I was going to do with. My partner did get his donuts. I felt the trip had been worth it though. During all of the months of lockdowns and all the days that Dan had been on our TVs, gaslighting us, keeping us isolated, damaging our health and the rest of it, I really did doubt my sanity. I honestly believed that I was alone in my thinking and that there was something wrong with me because of how I thought. Meeting Morgan and Monica in person was my first real life interaction with another human being that felt the way I did. And that fistful of stickers, it was going to change my life. I just didn't know it yet. When lockdown five was announced, I released the now infamous Instagram video that went viral around the world, clocking up 40 million views in just six days. Once again, I was just saying out loud what so many people were suffering in silence. I spoke of the financial impact, of the emotional and psychological impact, and what it was like to be deemed non-essential and the need of the COVID policy to be made better. At first, the reactions were highly positive. Suddenly, I was being invited onto Breakfast TV where I was advocating for small business support and with the hosts nodding along and people sending me messages of thanks for speaking out for them. It really seemed like for a moment, like the world was listening. And for a moment, I allowed myself to believe that people did care. Like maybe people like me weren't being abandoned alone to suffer. It was wishful thinking. Young mum arrested in her home over a Facebook post has accused Victoria police of being heavy handed. You're under arrest in relation to incitement. Incitement? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, you're not obliged to say or do anything, but anything you say or do may be given in evidence. Excuse me, incitement for what? What, what, what on earth? Yeah. Excuse me, what What on earth? Yeah, just put your phone down. Can you, it's like, record to... this? I'm in my pajamas. What's I this? An ultrasound in an hour. Before yeah, I she's know. pregnant. You don't have authorization to be on the property. Open the door. Hey, stop breaking my shit! Leave my shit! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hey! At the moment, you're under arrest for incitement. Have you guys been following me? You do not have to say I do anything, but anything you say to you may report and give them evidence. Do you understand that? Do you understand that, Monica? No comment. And, well, that day I ended up one of those um, sacrifices, I guess, to the Andrews government. As the pandemic wore on, we saw arrest after arrest of those who spoke up, and especially of those who protested. As I continued speaking out, as I kept publicly declaring that I was going to protests and calling for others to join me, I knew that it was only a matter of time before they came for me. I began to sleep badly, being woken by every car door closing, every voice on the street, hyper-aware even of just passing cars. 
Twice, the police came to my door to threaten me. Twice, I reminded them that protest is a human right, and I wasn't going to stop. But I knew it was only a matter of time before they showed up for more than just a chat. The months dragged on into a year, and I was feeling more and more at odds with Victoria Police. I felt like I was living a double life, smiling at work during the day and cursing Victoria Police Command at night as I watched the footage of cops arresting people for not wearing masks, walking the beaches in riot gear, stopping families with kids from swimming, taking the cups out of people's hands to make sure that there was coffee in them to justify why they weren't wearing a mask. It was maddening. Yet I still obeyed and I followed the rules. On weekends, I'd time my allowed one hour of exercise to align to the city protests. I'd walk the outskirts, keeping some distance, but close enough to bear eyewitness. I saw mums, dads, teenagers and children. I saw small business owners, blue collar workers and migrants marching to protest political interference in their daily lives. I saw smiles and happy faces. I saw flags and signs and the multicultural melting pot that is our nation. And I saw riot police, armed to the teeth, and I knew it was disproportionate and absurd. I felt sick. I couldn't go on living like this. I continued doing nightly lives at 9pm every night for the next year and attended every single process for the next 12 months as our state struggled with the world's harshest lockdowns. People were desperate and they were hitting the streets but they were being targeted with increased violence from a police force that wanted to silence the opposition to Premier Daniel Andrews. I went from just being a dad selling bathrooms with no interest in politics to a human rights peacekeeper standing between protesters who had lost everything and a politicised police force. When I look back it's surreal and I guess I shouldn't be surprised at what happened next. My only crime was that I spoke out. I gave a voice to the voiceless in my videos online. But it was after this second viral video reached 40 million people that I then became a target. I was branded a COVID denier, an anti-vaxxer and smeared as everything else. They found an ally in my ex-business partner. He released a hit piece on me where he strangely neglected to mention that he was a partner in that business that failed. But he claimed that I trade, traded insolvent and had ripped off small businesses and made claim after claim that he never had to prove. And the next minute I had a current affair hunting me down at home and on the street looking for a juicy story. <laughs> What followed was a public lynching. I was doxxed with my address and my phone number being published online. People began to abuse me, all my photography clients, so that they would cancel their contracts with me. I received untold death threats from total strangers and never for a moment did one of them ask if any of this were true. But the worst was the rape threats. <laughs> People were driving past my home, getting out of their cars, banging on my windows at all hours of the day and night. My phone, my email and my social media were being blasted with relentless abuse and direct threats of the most viral kind. Even my local newspaper published a hit piece with my face on the cover, never once stopping to ask if any of the accusations were true. Now I was trapped in my own home, unable to escape the abuse, the threats, the drive-bys, but also unable to so much as go as the, to the supermarket with fear of what could happen to me in the car park. My friends had abandoned me. I had no income, no savings. I couldn't leave, but I couldn't stay where I was. I didn't eat for two weeks. I didn't leave my house and I didn't turn on any lights. I stayed there in that darkness. It was clear these people would not be satisfied until I took my own life, and I came very close. My life was over, is what they told me. That they wanted, that's what they wanted me to believe. All for the crime of speaking against the lockdowns in Melbourne. As tensions continued to rise, I attended the now infamous protest on August 21st, 2021. We marched for a while with no problems, always avoiding the confrontations with the police. But when the police formed a line at Flinders Street Station and the march was blocked, I went to the front to make sure everyone was safe and to ensure no, no one did anything stupid. 
I was confronted with officers holding what looked like paintball guns. I feared that they were about to escalate their violence even further than it already was. But I did once again what I'd been doing for a year up to that point. I tried to keep the peace. I approached them and I appealed to them, what is that? Like at that rally, I think there was a good 10,000 people uh, when Matthew Lawson was shot. And, <clears throat> um, you know, yeah, we were sort of waiting, you know, what are they going to do next? Because they need to break this up. Because if they don't, we're going to have 100,000 people here next week. I was, there, I was there that day when the guns came out. They just, they, they, they had these weapons. They were pepper ball guns. I just heard someone from the back of, like, from behind me saying, they've got a, they've got a, they've got a gun, they've got a gun. I didn't understand at the time that rubber bullets could do that much harm. I learned later they can actually kill. And I saw the bruises on some people's bodies. As horrible as it was to see, it was not surprising. I was in an absolute state of shock. A police force that I trusted to protect me had shot me repeatedly at point blank range. I was broken. The internal bruising was agony. It would be months before I could lift my arms above my shoulders. Rubber bullets, or so-called less lethal weapons, have killed people before. And at that range, they could very well have killed me on that day. My government was willing to risk an act of murder for the sake of ensuring obedience. I was truly broken. It was months before I left my house again. But for all the physical damage, it was the mental damage that really took its toll. In the days after I was shot, the I Stand with Dan mob had been cheering on social media. According to them, I deserved it. Some wished it had been worse, that I died. Other wi others wished that more people had been shot. It was bewildering to witness such senseless hate, and I came really close to truly giving up. My double life was about to end. I felt like I was betraying myself, and I had to be bold. This was it, no turning back. I turned off my phone, I emptied my pockets of all of my identification. I got dressed in my best black outfit, styled with black masks and sunglasses, and I snuck out of my apartment to hit the streets of Melbourne. I was about to commit a real crime in defiance of these ridiculous pandemic laws, and I couldn't afford to get caught. I snuck along the Crown Promenade, and I whipped out those stickers I'd brought from Morgan months early, and I stuck them on lamp posts, bench seats, restaurant windows and signs. I felt like such a lawbreaker. I was posting bills. There's a fine for that, you know. The adrenaline was pumping, but it felt good to do something. Only a few days after, I was at my local IGA and the tradie protest went past. Some tradies stopped and asked about local uh, public toilets. We didn't have any, so I invited them up to use my uh, bathroom in their building. One took up the offer and he came up in the lift with me. We got chatting and he asked me what I did for a living. I could see his eyes widen and his face drop in horror as the words fell out of my mouth. I'm a cop realising that he thought I was a part of some elaborate sting to break him away from the group to arrest him, I quickly reassured him that I was a good cop and supported their protest. He told me his story. He was a migrant from a corrupt political regime who was old enough to know what creeping into a dictatorship looks like and he didn't want to see the same thing happen here. He was vaccinated, but he wanted to support his workmates, even if it cost him his job. He showed me anyone can take a stand if they're willing to make some sacrifices. Over the long months of lockdowns, I had many people reach out to me. They needed someone, anyone, to listen to them. And I found myself swimming in a sea of other people's despair as they poured out their hearts to me. I replied to as many of them as I could. I spent many a long night in my garage, <coughs> away from my family, reading, weeping, replying, and drinking to numb the pain. Some of the people who reached out to me in their moment of crisis, people like Carly, some of them pulled through, some of them didn't. I didn't recognise at the time that I was developing severe anxiety and hypervigilance. Opening my emails or messages filled me with dread, and just a car door on the street was enough to set my heart racing. Just to still my mind and get a bit of peace, 
I drank more in that 12 months than I had drunk in my entire life before then. The saving grace for me, probably the reason why I never completely broke, was that I'd always expected that this day would come. In fact, I said to my wife before I proposed to her that I expected I would end up in prison someday because of my work as a political commentator. It was clear to me nearly 10 years ago that criticising the government in this country was going to become an increasingly dangerous hobby. Her reply, she said, just make sure I know who to call when it happens. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why I proposed. And so as, I, as events unfolded, we both could see that the time was coming for me to make good on my promise. We prepared a four-page game plan for my wife to follow in the event of my arrest. Would they hold me without bail like they did with Nick Patterson? Would they imprison me with unreasonable bail conditions as they did with Monica Smith? Would they hospitalise me with a violent arrest as they had with so many? There was no way we could know. So we made our plans and had a procedure, had a procedure for everything. Even answering the door had a system to ensure my son was safely away from any forced entry. Plus, I made off-site backups of my phone and computers in case they were seized. Basically, I did all the things you would have to do if you were a drug lord or a mafia hitman. But I, as a political commentator turned human rights activist, had to do that in the free country of Australia. With that done, there was nothing left to do but to keep protesting, speaking out, being there for others and helping them to face another sunrise, waiting for the police to come for me and trying not to break in the meantime. To be honest, when the arrest happened, the only thing I felt was relief. After seven weeks of hell, relentless fear and deep hopelessness, I realised I had to make a decision. This is my life and I'll decide what happens next. Somehow I found the courage to, and the strength to say, screw you, to all the haters, to the liars, the wannabe murderers and the rapists, screw you all. And especially screw you to the people who said, I'll never have a voice again. I spoke up for what was right. I became a voice for the voiceless. And when I spoke, the world heard. 40 million people heard. And after all that, I'd been through, I decided that I was not finished and the world would hear my voice again. Are You OK Day was coming up and I decided I was going to make a point of all the double standards of this wokeism. First, I released a video to address the lies and set the record straight about what I did and did not do. Then, on Are You OK Day, I posted a video calling out the people who only seem to care about mental health when it makes them look good on social media. They were only too happy to join in on the pylon to destroy me, but on Are You OK Day, these hypocrites were busy pretending as if they cared about mental health. I may not get 40 million views again, but you can bet I will never be silent. After multiple surgeries, months of fear and pain at home, and countless battles with the black dog in the darkness, I knew I had to make a decision. Melbourne's my home, and I wasn't about to give up on it. I hoped I could make a difference if I just kept working to bring back the peaceful, beautiful home that I once knew. So I grappled with my fear and anxiety, and I rejoined the protests. My first protest uh, back was in the city. Early that morning, Daniel Andrews and a cast of others had joined forces on TV, making threats of extreme levels of violence against us. We were chased out of the city by the anti-terror squad and regrouped at the shrine. And once again, I found myself on the front lines. This sort of behaviour is unlawful, it's ugly, it will not be tolerated. So if you're thinking about coming into the city today, just know that Victoria Police will deploy whatever tactics they need to um, in order to um, in ensure that you are held accountable. In addition to that, stinger grenades which deploy uh, rubber pellets. These crowd control equipment uh, munitions were necessary and they are necessary. Uh, coming up, Ollie, if we can... Oh, that's the Bearcat. This is the heavily fortified police vehicle, you can see an armed officer. And then they were pushed down the centre of Swanson Street that turns into St Kilda Road and they were, the police kind of like um, moved them that way. At a Shrine of Remembrance. These protesters are there fighting for our freedoms 
And a big part of the Shrine of Remembrance is to honour the fallen who fought for our freedoms overseas. It's a sad indictment on the fact that we have to protest in our own country for our own freedoms that existed before COVID-19. Uh, and it wasn't our desire to come back here, but when they started using the anti-terror squad and driving the bear cat through the streets of Melbourne, labelling people who were simply political opponents of the government, labelling them as terrorists, well, unfortunately, we were left with very little choice but to appeal to our history, to appeal to our ancestors, to appeal to the freedoms that they fought for, that we inherited, and right now we are letting slip away in our generation, and I won't stand for that, neither will all the people here. It's all OK. The day police fired rubber bullets on protesters at the Shrine of Remembrance was my line in the sand. I couldn't stay quiet anymore. Shooting unarmed civilians, running away from police. I was convinced someone was going to get killed. I couldn't take another day of it. I couldn't be a part of an organisation responsible for causing so much harm to the people it had a duty to protect. So I made a decision. And a week later, I was sitting in Matt Wong's interview chair on his channel Discernible, in full police uniform, telling anyone who cared to listen that we were on the wrong path. 
the, the consequences of me being here today um, is that I will be resigning from Victoria Police effective at the end of this interview. I, I lost all interest in, in doing my job because I just thought, why? Why am I here working for an organisation that claims to serve the community and I'm seeing anything but? I was ashamed of the organisation. I quit my job, live in interview, and I handed my badge in that evening. I challenged Dan Andrews to let people peacefully exercise their human right to protest. And it was just a month later that Victoria Police finally stopped persecuting protesters, and we saw the biggest protest in Victorian history. A protest that was peaceful and safe for both the community and my fellow colleagues. The police have finally stopped the violence and started to actually do their jobs in the right way. When I was at the protest, I made a point of trying to speak to the senior officers to tell them my story, to tell them about my injuries and my ongoing surgeries, my physical trauma and the long road to recovery. But I also expressed my desire to rebuild community bonds, to work with them to repair the injuries that had been done to my beautiful home city. Someone had to extend an olive branch and make a way for us to come back together. And I decided to be that someone and do what I could. My bail conditions meant that I could no longer join the protests, but I knew my work was far from done. With the help of an amazing team, I got to work directing the documentary Battleground Melbourne. It tells the story of the fall of the world's most livable city through the eyes of those that risked everything to save it. Once the police did stop suppressing protests, I asked my bail officer if I could return, now that they weren't considered illegal. He said that I could. So 575 days after I spoke at the very first anti-lockdown protest, I returned to speak at what turned out to be the biggest protest in Victorian and perhaps Australian history. When Daniel Andrews tried to tear us apart, that is what brought us together. Yeah! It was when he took our jobs and our businesses that we truly began to work yeah! together. It was when he locked us down that we began to stand up together. When he sowed division amongst our friends and our families, that is when we found our tribe. Daniel Andrews tried to break us, break our will with the full weight of his twisted so-called laws. But we realised a deeper truth, that good people break bad laws. And so after everything that's happened, my life being turned upside down and very nearly ended, I turned my attention back to my photography business and continued the rebuilding of my life. Instead of hiding from the controversies in my past, I chose to wear them as a badge of honour. Here's the truth. I spoke for myself and others who were hurting and the mob tried to have me killed for it. When they failed, well, they failed. I'm still standing and I'm going to keep using my voice. When the opportunity arose, I threw myself into helping produce Battleground Melbourne because I wanted to help others tell their stories too. And in the process, I rebuilt my confidence and found my feet. The funny thing about being cancelled is it only hurts the first time. They've tried to cancel me again and they've discovered, much to their frustration, that I have immunity now, which is more than we can say for that vaccine. Sorry. <laughs> True stings a little, doesn't it? They've tried to cancel me again, and they've, sorry, and I survived their best efforts, and now they've got nothing. I'm truly free. My efforts to build a bridge with Victoria Police have paid off. I've been invited by the Victoria Police to talk to young officers about building trust about protests and peaceful resolutions. I truly believe we can rebuild a better Melbourne our way. And just as I'm slowly healing from the physical and mental damage done to me, in time, I hope to see Melbourne heal as well. Leaving Vic Pole felt like losing a limb. 
Speaking publicly as a mostly introvert was anxiety inducing, not to mention the career suicide. My decision came at a big cost. The career I had longed for, my wage and financial security, my lifelong police friends, my privacy and reputation. But if my interview, if my challenge to Victoria Police and Daniel Andrews played even a small part in making that peaceful protest happen, it was worth it. And even if it didn't, it was still worth it because above all else, it was the right thing to do. These are our stories, and they're all true, as unbelievable as that may seem. These are just four stories out of the thousands of ordinary people who faced extraordinary times and made life-changing decisions to stand up for what was right, even when it was their government who was wrong. This isn't Hollywood. There's no guaranteed happy endings here. Each of us still pays a price for the stand that we took for making our decisions. Whether it's ongoing criminal incitement charges, mental, emotional, physical trauma, the loss of so much of what we loved, the cost of the battleground Melbourne era has been unimaginable. But we're not looking for your sympathy. There's one thing we all want you to remember from today, and it's this. We are ordinary people who faced extraordinary times and reached a simple realization that good people break bad laws. No one knows what the future holds, but what gives me great comfort is the fact that there are ordinary people everywhere. And I've seen with my own eyes what ordinary people are capable of. To hear more of our stories, please watch the internationally acclaimed multi-award winning documentary, Battleground Melbourne. You can watch it in full and for free at battlegroundmelbourne.com. Thank you for listening to our stories and journeying with us today in Battleground Melbourne Live. Thank you.